Welcome to the Writer Dojo with your host, Steve Diamond. What up? And Larry Correa. Via con Dios. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Today's episode, Supporter Spectacular. Round one. All right, everybody. I don't even... Uh, the, the, these are the things that I have to deal with, that I deal with for all of you, for all of your benefit. This is what I deal with, everybody. Welcome back to the Writer Dojo. Um, we're glad to have you with us. Now, today is a special day, Larry, because today is the first day where we get to recognize the however many, uh, I think we're somewhere close to 50 supporters now. Yeah, that's very cool. Which we we appreciate you guys that are that are back in Writer Dojo. Uh, and as I've had this conversation with Steve and Jack, uh, that normally I, when I do stuff like this, I'm very much... Uh, you know, I, I, I just doing it for fun. And, and uh, you know, so like I wasn't going to like talk about financial backers. Uh, but Stephen Jack will both shut your mouth. We have day jobs still. Yeah. You, you snooty, you know. <laughs> I know. I'm still, I'm, I'm still trying to, I'm still trying to angle to get the, uh, to somehow, I don't know, turn into, I don't know, hurry, hurry and get a movie made or something so I can be your executive assistant. Working on it, man. Working on it. Well, Jack, Jack's already in line for Supremo Marketing Hefe forever. That's fine. Um, I don't want to do marketing. <laughs> it's true. So what we're doing this episode, this year, these are questions that have been sent in by the backers of Writer Dojo. And uh, we're going to try to go through and answer as many of these as we can. We got a bunch. Yeah, we did. Uh, so what we're going to do is some of these will actually, I'll read them, but um, they're going to wind up waiting because it's a topic that we're planning on doing an episode already. Uh, so you'll be getting a full uh, episode talking yeah. about that topic. But there's a bunch of smaller ones. So that's what we're going to do this today is we're going to try to bang through a bunch of these. Now, the, the first the first question I think we we should address before we get specifically in there, and that is, what are the perks of being a supporter of Rider Dojo? Uh, and and this is the first one. This yeah. is it. The, your questions that you ask get preference. Yep. Period. So you guys will send questions. So if you back us, send your email to Jack. Uh, and it's questions at writerdojo.com, and we will answer your questions on the air. And when I read your emails, I will not do silly voices like I do when I, the emails <laughs> we, where we, we, we reserve that for people we hate and we don't hate you. We love you. No, we like you guys. Uh, and so, uh, that's for, and then we also like when I open the swag store, uh, we'll, we'll give early passes yep. to the writer dojo. Members. One of the, one of the things that we'll do later on, uh, and, and we haven't really announced this yet. Yeah. This and this is, uh. Once per season, what we're going to do is Larry and I are going to do a little live stream and the supporters will be able to join in on that live stream. And what Larry and I are going to do is from start to finish, we're basically going to do uh, the equivalent of the panels that we've both done, which is the kind of brainstorm a, a story in an hour or in two hours. We're going to do one of those. It's probably going to be longer than two hours. Well, it's going to be a long episode. So, um, And it will only be available to you as a supporter and you know, you'll be in the chat. You can ask us questions. Um, you can ask us about our processes, but the main thing is, is we want you to see our process from start to finish in action. It's one thing for us to, to say like, this is what we do, yeah. but it's a whole different thing to see two people doing it. I've also found too, when we answer that question on the air and we're like, this is how I do it. A lot of times we tend to give the idealized version of it, like the academic detached version of, well, I do this and this. Mm -hmm. But then when you see it live, a lot of times it's a little more freeform. So, well, and, and then we're, we're also working on one other thing and it's based on, there were a couple comments that were made about seeing some of mine and Larry's uh, old stuff that we wrote together. Many, many years ago. Many, many. I mean, for me, it was literally my first sale. First thing you ever wrote professionally. Yep. What was that? 13, 14 years ago? 13, 14 years ago. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I think it was, it's I think old. it was 2009. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's, so uh, but we have some old stories. That, uh, so, we're, we're going to, I'm going to lay those out for y'all. And supporters are going to get an ebook copy of that. Well, we're actually, yeah, we're actually thinking about doing a cleaned up version yep. too. Or, we're now that we know we're gonna, going to, yeah, we're definitely going to do a cleaned up version of that later. And the, the stuff that Larry and I are referencing, it's the Tombs and Santos stories. They're pretty good. Um, they're, they're super good. They're super fun. Uh, very violent. Um, you know, kind of on that line of horror and action-y type stuff. You know what we should do for the 
backers too is we should probably take some of our old game fiction from where you learned to write. Oh my heavens, we could totally do that. We totally could do that. Yeah, that's what that's pretty good. So we'll we'll put some of this stuff together for you, um, and and we're gonna email some of that stuff out. So anyway, that's just the start of what we're gonna do. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to come up with, with more stuff as time goes on. And as we get better suggestions or we see someone else doing something that we like, and we'll just steal that idea from them yeah. because we're shameless thieves. Totally. Totally. All right. But Larry, what's the first actual question? The first question is from supporter Matt. Uh, so Matt, I'm not going to use your last names guys, just because, you know, I don't want to out you and also Protect the I'm guilty. mispronounce them. Yep. Uh, so Matt asks, what is your preferred method for saving the shower thoughts ideas that come along during the course of a day notepad tape recorder carrier pigeon yeah so when you get those cool ideas how do you how do you note them down steve man for me um i i end up sending texts to myself uh i i just have an ongoing chain and i just text myself in fact i i, I was at uh, i was just telling you a little bit ago i was at a uh, i took my son to the renegade sands of 311. nice so as a his, he's wearing his 311 hat. I am wearing a 311 hat. Um, so I took I took my son to that. It's his first real concert, and beforehand they were showing um, all these posters that these artists had done. And I'm super influenced by art when it comes to ideas. And there were a few things in there. Where I'm like, dang, that's really cool. I like I like what that image, like the thoughts that that image puts in my head. And so I I pulled out my phone and I just texted myself mm -hmm. the different things. That's what I do. What do you do? I've, I've done the text thing uh -huh. where especially the middle of the night <laughs> yeah. where I've woken up and I've texted myself or you know, I've actually emailed myself. Like, like so I woken up, like had a dream and texted or messaged myself. And then the next day I'll read it. And it's like, what the crap was that? And I won't even remember. And I'll have no context. Won't make any sense. Uh, waking hours, normally what I'll do is I'll have a Word document. And even if it's the uh, book I'm currently working on, but it doesn't fit, I'll throw it down at the bottom. Uh, Steve's seen this now in action. Yeah. Now we've written a book together. Yep. I call it the to-do list. And the reason I call it that is I can go control F to do or to do list and go right to it. Um, and I will put down different thoughts and things usually in that Word document. And later I will move it to something more permanent. I have written stuff down on receipts. <laughs> <laughs> I have written with a Sharpie on my hand. Oh, dear. I, 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 I'm one of those guys. That's actually, super old school. Yeah, I actually, I'm one of those guys. I have a bad habit. I actually do write notes on my hands. Uh, I used to do this as an accountant. If you remember. Yeah, yep. Uh, like, like some, there would be like some I remember that. And I would I straight do remember up, that. I would, write it on my hand you know i do remember you doing that and it's the stupidest thing ever but it's a habit i picked up on the farm when i was a kid uh and there was just times where you had to write down information on the fly and you didn't have anything to you know work with uh, so i would write stuff on my arm i would literally write like cow numbers down my arm like like oh you know this cow needs uh you know this cow needs uh <laughs> this cow needs antibiotics number three four three and antibiotic and I would be written on my arm with a marker. So one of the <laughs> one of the good grief. So really? one of the one of the things that that I did um, for a long time is and I and I still do this on occasion. I don't I don't get quite the cool the cool the cool uh, emails like this anymore. Um, everyone gets spam emails, right? Everyone, and oftentimes they're from these weird, crazy, outlandish names. Yeah. So I would pull a, a document off to the side. And I still have this saved on my computer. And if the names are cool, like I'll copy and I'll paste those into a document as names to use later. So I, st I steal people's um, fake identities online. Well, that's what they get for messing with you. That's right. It serves them right. So I think that I think that answers the question. So we're, as you can see, Steve and I are super organized. We're all over the place. <laughs> I mean, the the reality for me is it doesn't matter. Like. Like wh wherever it works, if the if the idea is really really freaking good, it's in my head. Yeah, I don't forget those. No, I don't forget that crap. I don't forget those. So there's some the sometimes it's funny too because I because I have other writers that are friends with and I'm family with, where I see where it's something that to me is not that cool of an idea like in my head, but I'll see where I've, I'll say it and they have that light yeah. bulb moment. Uh, yesterday I was driving with my daughter to the airport to pick up my wife. She's coming back from a trip, and we were just talking, and I, I said a line, and Hinkley immediately was like, oh, 
oh, I'm stealing that. And I, I even think I was, I was just making conversation. Mm-hmm. And I won't even tell you what the what is a title for a short story, basically. Nice. I can't tell you what it is because, you know, it's a great title and she's going to use it now. But um, it was just this moment of, so for her, that went in her brain cage, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay, so our next one is from supporter Mark. Uh, Mark asks, what do you find is the best way to show appreciation to those people who have been influenced or influential in your lives, short of the typical dedication at the beginning of a novel or verbally uh, during panel discussions? Ooh, um, th- the there's there, there's two things that I do. Um, the the snarky one is I murder the crap out of you in a story. If I if I love you and I like you, I murder you. Yeah. I've killed a lot of people that yeah. I like in stories. I've, I think I've murdered you in a couple stories. I've been killed in several stories. I think you've, you have you murdered me. I've murdered you. I've murdered a lot of my friends. Oh, yeah. I don't really do that as much anymore now that I do the charity red shirt. Yeah, yeah, thing. right. I do do the dedications at the beginning of the books. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't do that for collaborative books as a rule of thumb. I usually just do it for solo novels. Uh, well, because collaborative is different, you know. I, I for this is like a personal thing, I guess. Uh, I do it for solo novels unless I forget. So you guys understand the way this works uh, is that's not on the original manuscript that I send to Bayon. Yeah, they usually ask for that after they the fact. They ask for that afterwards. Like at the very end when they're doing the basically the, the typesetting, copy. Yeah, yeah. Phase. It's when they're laying it out. Whereas during layout, I was like, do you have a dedication? And if I do have a dedication and I think of it in time, I send it to them. But if I don't think of it in time, then... So that's what you see. Some of my books have dedications. Others do not. I usually just use the first name. Yeah. Uh, because I don't want to like, you know, I have enough people that hate my guts. The last thing I need to do is have crazy people screaming at the people I'm trying to <laughs> thank in books. Uh, but they know who they are. Uh, I don't know. What's some other stuff? Gosh, for, for me, I just try to be overt. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm not shy about, for example, with you, right? Like, I, you know, you know how influential you've been to me. Yeah, that's right. And so I know <laughs> and you, for, for good or ill. Um, but, uh, y- I try to be very uh, overt and or public about it. So yep. if, um, shoot, I was at a, um, I was at a, huh, I'm going to say this without using the name of said um, podcast. I was on a, a, a writing retreat on a cruise ship for a different podcast, you know, that you and I both know. Yeah. And uh, it was very interesting um, a lot of the people there were on the very woke side of the spectrum, and I am definitely not on that side of the spectrum. And there were a number of people there who weren't either. And m- many of them came over and asked me, like, "Oh, who 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 are some of your influences? Who do you go for?" And and I say a few people. Um, you know, I talk about Robert McCammon all the time. I talk about uh, Brian Lumley all the time. I talk about Joe Lansdale all the time. Uh, and I and I and I and I would bring up your name. And of course, this would lead to the natural him. And that goes either two ways. There's either a vampire hiss. Yeah. Of a, like, know, uh, or really? Yeah. Like you guys give each other like this. We, yeah, we the give each other the, handshake. you know, the baseball signals, yeah, handshakes and stuff. Conservative handshake. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> and, but, but, you know, my thing is I'm not, I'm not shy about that. Like, like people are my, people who are my influences. I don't, I don't really care what, uh what side of any political spectrum they're on. I don't, I don't care. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they've been. Um, like if you've been influential to me, you've been influential to me and that's to my benefit. Yeah. It's credit where credit's due. You got to give people credit. Um, the people that have helped you, you give them credit. And I, I try to do that. It's like, I try to thank people that have done stuff for me who've taught me things. Um, and that's really, I guess all you can do. And we, we've talked about on the show a lot. We've mentioned a lot of names of a lot of people that we've learned stuff from. Yeah. Um, and there's some that I've learned stuff from that on a personal level, we don't get along at all, but sure. I still learn stuff from them. Yeah. You know, so I, I guess that I try to answer that, I suppose. Um, let's okay, see. Where are we at? Um, next question. Cause we're, we were, oh, should we, we're coming up on break, but our next question is Dee Dee asks, I would like to know what question they each get asked <laughs> the most that they enjoy answering. And the one they hate to answer and why for each. Ooh. We talked about this one actually a little bit before we started. Yeah, because this one's kind of hard. This is actually a really hard question. And the conclusion that we came to while we were talking about this is that there's not really a, such a thing as a bad question. Because I've had questions 
over and over again that I don't mind answering. I've had questions that I hate answering, but it all comes down to who's asking. It's like it's like the thing with dogs, right? There's no such thing as a bad dog. There's only a bad owner. And so what I was telling Steve earlier, there's, there's, there's the people I don't like are what call, what's called ask holes, you know? <laughs> That's where somebody doesn't have, they don't have knowledge, so they come to you because you have expertise and they ask you questions and you take the time and you educate them and you answer the questions and you explain it all to them and then they go do something else entirely anyway. Uh, and they, they ignore everything you say, yeah. screw it all up and then act baffled. Yeah, I don't, if, if someone approaches me and they're, they're completely sincere in whatever question it is, and it doesn't matter how basic it is, because you, you guys got to understand that the people that Larry and I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis when we're, when we're at these conventions or, or just shows or whatever, they range from, oh, from, from guys like, like, I mean, we've been around David Weber who, who knows more than, who's forgotten more than both of us have learned. You know, Dave's, a, Dave's a walking encyclopedia. Yeah. Yeah. Or on the success train, you know, guys like, like Jim or Laurel who, who have, yeah, who have of magnitude. who have like extra zeros on their paychecks that we hope to attain one day? Yeah, I mean they they and so it's it's interesting and it's like. Um, but then we also have the the absolute beginner who has never even written a paragraph before. Yeah, you get the level one newbie writer and they have questions <laughs> and sometimes you, you got to just realize everybody's coming at this from a different angle and a different level of experience. So there's not really any bad questions. There's a lot of questions I've been asked a thousand times and I don't yeah. mind as long as it's coming from a, a person that's, uh, you know, honest and, and trying to get better. The people, I mean, I, I hate the people who ask you what to do and then they totally do their own stupid thing and then they fail and they, they, they are like crying about it. Or you spend, you spend 10 minutes, I mean, shoot, man, I've spent, and I know you've done this too, someone will come and ask you a question and you'll spend 10, 15, 20 minutes answering a question from a person. And then they kind of look at you at the end and you realize they didn't actually care. Yeah, that sucks. That's like, that sucks bad. That? The other one, uh, I don't know, we're, we're, we're coming up on break, but, but I, as I figure, I don't like the rigged questions where people like have a, they, they're looking, they're, they're like fishing for an answer to like on the grounds that it will incriminate you yeah and so what i do when i get those especially at events like live events i just i answer honestly i just headbutt them but i know going in that they're looking for they're looking for well, why do you do this it's like okay i do it because this boom let's go yeah. oh i mean i've been asked that straight up about you in fact it was on that cruise why do you associate why do you associate with, with larry korea a he's a racist dude. and i'm and i, I look at him and i'm like and i'm like y you know he's not white right well, my dad was darker skinned than Barack Obama. So this came as a great shock. You yeah. Know? Uh, and so it's, it's, it's just utter horse crap. I'm, just for the record, guys, I'm like the least racist person you know because I'm an individualist. I hate everybody. Yeah, exactly. You know, but I hate white people the most. <laughs> well, there's more of them to hate. For me, the, the, question, the question that I love getting, the question that I just love getting all the time, and that's why do you write horror? And, and I'll, and I'll talk about that. And there's, I either give the really long answer that I'm not going to give right now because, you know, we have all sorts of different things, you know, in, in episodes and stuff to come about that sort of a thing. But the one that I give the best, we're like, man, Steve, you write a lot of torture scenes and horror and murder and really dark stuff. Why do you write that stuff? And my answer is always the same. Once upon a time, I was told, write what you know. <laughs> we'll be right back. All Kira wanted was a dog for Christmas. But when Santa delivers a baby Keiju instead, she is determined to fix this mistake, one way or the other. Recruited by Santa to help save Christmas, Kira will discover not only the meaning of Christmas, but the mystery behind the baby Keiju. From the deep, dark depths of the Pacific Ocean to the snow-covered tops of the Rocky Mountains, Kira will discover that sometimes doing the right thing is the scariest thing of all. Available exclusively on Amazon for only 99 cents, author Jason Cordova brings you a heartwarming Christmas story suitable for all ages. Grab your copy today. Alrighty, welcome back to our first Q&A session for our supporters. Thank you all you supporters. We really appreciate it. Um, remember, every dollar that you donate goes directly into the fund of getting Steve out of his day job. <laughs> <laughs> Truth and advertising, people. All right. 
Let's move on to the next question, Larry. I like this one. This is from Emma. She says, I enjoy the world building portion of a writing project, but also find it daunting. How do you balance your desire to plan all the details, including ones that will probably never show up in your story, with not getting bogged down so you never finish the story? Oh, that's an excellent question. That's a great question. Yeah. Now, here's what I will say about this. Depending on when this airs, we will have discussed or will be about to discuss the setting as a point of entry into your story as how you start writing, just like we did with some of the character centric yep. ones. And we go into this a little bit there and this will not be the last time we'll go into this. We'll go into this hyper, hyper, hyper detail okay, later. This is a big, this is a big, this topic. is a huge topic, but let's try to do a small, like couple minute cliff notes version. What I would say on that is you want to do enough world building that you are comfortable to go play in it. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to answer every question because that never ends. In fact, um, when you and I wrote Servants of War, we knew, well, when it first started, and we'll have an episode about that, like this was in an existing world um, yeah, for, we'll, for a different we'll IP. A, when actually when the book comes out, we should do a yeah. whole big episode but, to explain the process. But at the end, before you turn the book over to me uh, to, uh, to go through and, and do a final edit, basically, I'd already written the draft. You were, had already partially gone through and had written some stuff. And it was at that point that you and I were, sat down and we were like, so uh, there's probably some world building stuff we should solidify at this point. There was some stuff that were like, hey, how does this work? Uh, oh. I don't know. Um, Magic. It's fantasy, Larry. Basically, Magic. Basically, don't let the world building hold you back because the beauty of word processing is you can always go back and fix it later. Fix it in post. Yeah. I see this thing where people will procrastinate the actual hard writing part of the novel for years because they're sitting there world building, world building, world building. Well, that's hard. That's yeah. the hard part. Yeah, because world building is fun for a lot of people. A lot of people really love that. That's their favorite part. Uh, and so they want to go out and write the Cimmerillion basically for their universe. And that's great and all, but you got to write the book. So if you're procrastinating writing the book, uh, you've waited too long. So you need to get out there. You need to get to writing and you need to know enough. And here's the thing too. What I'll do is my little editing trick is, as I'm writing a book and I come across a world thing that I don't know, like I need to name a river or what is over on the other side of these mountains or how does this, how does this system work or what's this level of technology, whatever it is, it's XXX. Yep. I put three X's in the manuscript when I get to, and we went across the river XXX. Because I don't know, but I'm on a roll. I don't want to stop. I don't want to stop and think it through. I don't want to stop and draw a map. I don't want to stop and, you know, figure out how this political system works in this world. I don't want to stop and think, what does this religion believe about this? They believe XXX. And I will come back to that later when I have time yeah. or I'm not, because if I'm in the zone, I'm going to keep cranking words out. Well, that's yeah. I mean, part. yeah, again, that's the hard part, especially... Uh, and, and we talked about this earlier, where maintaining your enthusiasm for your story is probably one of the more important things for you to do. And if you staring at the paper going, well, crap, what should I name this river? What should I name this river? And you're staring at that for five, 10, 15. I mean, one minute is too long for crying out loud. Just like whatever, who cares? Like you said, put, put a few X's down, move on, because it's far more important for you to get words on the page. Yeah, well, like, for example, I just got, I, I haven't sent this to you yet, but uh, for the book that Steve and I did, uh, you know, we were dealing with kind of like proto-Slavic, Russo-Finnish, Polish, Czech, you know, Bulgarian, Hungarian, you know, various groups of people all thrown together. But we, so they had all these amalgamated amal cultures. Uh, so I, I sent this over to some different people to read mm -hmm. and I got, I got their comments back because there's different parts where I was like, wow, it'd be really cool somewhere in here to like throw some cool little cultural references. Yeah. But I don't know them. So, so I'm going to just like come back later after people who do know those things can give me some feedback uh -huh. that I can go back and put those little cool tidbits of world building in. Um, so that's how I look at it. So Emma, uh, I hope that helps. Yeah. We'll, we'll delve into that more. Yeah. Like, they so don't, is, don't worry. Get, get to writing. <laughs> that's the, that's the hard part. Okay. Let's see. What, let's see. Uh, I've got, I've got one from Sue. Sue? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's read the one from Sue. All right. Sue says, when you have what you think is a really cool idea, how do you know if there's a story in it? Hmm. Interesting question. 
I think that's going to depend on you as the creator and how good you are at picking stories out of stuff. Some writers I know are kind of slow burn on that, and so it takes a while on ideas, and they kind of like will accumulate ideas in their in their brain box until you know they have enough. Others will kind of just go off. We'll take one little nugget and just run. So I don't know if there's a really a correct answer for that. You know, I I think that maybe. I don't know. I, I wonder if part of this just comes down to practice because you're going you're gonna to be inundated with ideas. As Larry and I have already talked about, ideas are the easy part. Yeah. They're a dime a dozen. They come when you want them to, when you don't want them to, when you're trying to sleep, while you're sleeping, when you're in the shower, when you're not in the shower. Like it doesn't matter. They're all over the place. Well, the first time you take an idea and you, and you twist it brutally into a story form, it takes quite a bit of work. Yeah by the hundredth time you've done that it's a piece of cake yeah and, and once and you'll see this with like writers with like anthologies right and so i, I just put together an anthology with uh, casey ezel it's called yeah. no game for nights sequel to noir fatale so it's more yeah. noir sci-fi fantasy source we had a couple authors had to drop out because of scheduling conflicts or whatever life got in the way they weren't able to write a story that kind of thing so we needed two last minute fill-ins so we picked up two authors we knew uh one that i knew one that casey knew we approached him real fast and said, hey, can you give me a noir story with the theme of a hard-boiled detective? It just has to be eight to 10,000 words. No pressure. Yeah, eight to 10,000 words. And I need it like <laughs> in a couple weeks. And it's funny because when you go to these writers, and they probably hadn't thought of this, of, of a noir story before, but you give them that, they're like, okay. <laughs> and I guaranteed that these two authors went out and probably thought about it for a day and uh, then got us a story the next week. That is the nature of practice. These these people are pros. They've done this. They've uh, they put in the work. They put in the effort. I guess that's why I say Sue is you're going to learn as you go. And sometimes you'll have ideas that there's just not that much meat to them, and there's not really a story there. I feel like if the idea suggests a story to you, it probably has a story. All right. This this one. I'm not sure if this person's a supporter or not, but it's one of the very first questions we got. When we uh, we first started the podcast, this, the voicemail one? this is the voicemail one. Yeah. So if you guys didn't know, through Anchor, you can send us voicemails, and you know we'll listen to them because I mostly heavy breathing. Yeah, a lot of that. Um, I I obsessively check uh, our our Anchor app. So uh, this one came in, and I'm gonna. This is from R. Kelly. Now the gist of this question, and and I'm not gonna play the voicemail later on when we when we pretend like we know what we're doing um we'll just we'll just play the the voicemails on the air this one says uh it, it's basically about analyzing chapters that feel off so in the process of writing oftentimes you get to a point where you've written chapter or you're in the process of writing a chapter and it's not feeling right it feels it feels off kilter or it doesn't feel like you're progressing or or maybe you're not um accomplishing what you originally wanted that chapter to accomplish. So how do you go about diagnosing that and what does it mean and how can we fix it? It's a little bit, it's a bigger topic. We'll definitely go deeper into it. So again, Cliff Notes version. Yeah, because we're going to do uh, episodes on the editing process. But for me personally, if if, uh, if a chapter or scene is not clicking, well, first off, I don't write chapters. Steve learned this. <laughs> yeah. I don't write chapters. I write scenes. And then at the end, when I'm editing it, then I group them into chapters. Because I find a lot of times if I'm giving chapter numbers as I go, they're going to be completely out of order. Cause yeah. Like this chapter works better earlier or later, or there's another chapter that needs to be added. So I do scenes. And if a scene is not working, I got to be real analytical. I got to put my uh, auditor hat on and say, why is this scene not clicking? I need to be harsh with myself. I need to be realistic. And this is hard because a lot of writers were very prideful. If we didn't think we were awesome at storytelling, we probably wouldn't try doing this, yeah. right? We think we're good. And so you got to be humble and say, okay, my subconscious is telling me that this sucks. Why am I unhappy with this? And then I need to be analytical and say, what is wrong? Because it could be a wide variety of things. It could be point of view characters wrong. Yeah. It could be tone is wrong. I've had where... Oh, gosh, I've done that. Oh, yeah, where the tone is just way too dark or way too light. For me, it's usually too light. Yeah, for Steve, Steve, the answer is like, I'm going to make it darker. Yeah. Which, oh, man, for me editing Steve, I was like, man, this is getting bleak. I got to throw in some, like, 
brotherly <laughs> kindness or something in here. Yeah. Good hell. Turns out the horror author goes dark. Weird. Yeah, in a World War One setting. Go figure. Um, no, so your brain is telling you something's wrong. Uh, now it's up to your conscious brain to figure out what is wrong. Yeah. It could be a million things. And, and here's what I think about that. Um, I, I agree with you 100%. The, the trouble with, with that, and I'm, not, and I'm not saying like the trouble with this question, no, because this is, this is something that every single author will deal with, bar none. Like there, there's hardly any absolutes in life, but if you're a writer, this is going to happen to you. Oh, you're going to be writing guaranteed, you know, like, you know, death taxes, you know, sure things like, yeah, having a chapter or, or if you're writing a short story where something just feels wrong in a scene or in the story as a whole. There's a few things about this that 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 I think could be potential reasons, and and just just go through them and be like Larry said, be super honest. Um, One of the best edits I ever got from Tony Weisskopf, I told you about this, was just a note on the top of the page because she does physical manuscript. I know. Oh my gosh. And it says, "This scene sucks. Make it not suck." Yeah. <laughs> and dead serious, that was what it said. And I had to figure it out. But the thing is, she was absolutely right. That scene did suck. Yeah. And I made it not suck. Well, and, and think about who you are as a writer. Um, Larry and I talked about, you know, outliners versus discovery writers a while back. Perhaps when you outlined it, you were too clinical. Perhaps you, you were trying to stick too rigidly to your outline. Or if you're a discovery writer, maybe, maybe you need to take a minute and actually plan this for a sec. Like there's, there's all sorts of different reasons for this. I've mentioned that before. It's like, I call it going up the wrong hill. Mm -hmm. Like you just went up the wrong hill yeah. and you got to the top of the hill and you looked around and you said, Oh, this is, I'm lost. This is not where I want to, meant to go. You can either backtrack down the hill and start over, or you can go off in a new direction, but you gotta, you gotta like put your big boy pants on and decide what to do. Otherwise it's going to yeah. turn into a model mess. Well, and, and, and I think that, that more often than not, some of this just comes with experience. It is too. Yeah, that's true. Because the longer you do this, the more you're able to recognize your own quirks. Yeah. Uh, I have certain traps that I fall into. As do I. And when I see that I'm falling into those traps, a lot of times I don't catch these on the first pass. I catch these on the edit. Well, and gosh, by the time you, especially if we're talking novel, like by the time you finish writing this story, good grief. You've read the novel You're done. Eight times, 10 You're times. so done with that. You're so done seeing that stuff. And what's on the page versus what's in your mind versus what you think is in on the page, what's only in your mind. It all, it all muddles together. And sometimes all you need is a beta reader. Yeah. Beta readers, alpha readers, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, um, pre-readers. We'll just say pre-readers. Yeah. My thing on them is don't trust anybody 100%. No. Um, I mean, you don't even trust me 100%. No, I don't I don't trust anybody 100%. Uh, but but what I'm looking for from people is if they're confused or bored. If people, and I, I got that from Orson Scott Card, uh, is who I heard that from originally. Is that's what he looks for in his alpha readers. Yep. If they're confused or bored, that's what you need to go check. Um, just because like if you send it out to 10 people and nine of them like something but one hated it, it's probably fine. Who cares? You send it out to 10 people and seven, seven, seven of them were confused or bored. You might need to take a look. Yeah, you got a problem. You want to check that out. All right. Okay, where are we at? Okay, you know what? We're going to call it good on this episode, this first Q&A session. But don't worry. We're going to do another one because we still have quite a few questions. Um, so stay tuned. Again, thank you very much. This is Writer Dojo. Thank you so much, supporters, for sending us these questions. And... Keep sending them. We love them. Thank you. Writer Dojo is Steve Diamond and Larry Correa. Produced by Jack Wilder and Baron Hair Studios. Theme song, Word Mercenaries by Craig Nivo. New episodes come out every Wednesday wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm slash writer dojo by leaving us a five-star rating or review and by helping to spread the word. All questions and comments can be emailed to questions at writerdojo.com. Thank you, all you supporters.